Let's pray to open the service. And how about your heart? You know, like, is, is your heart open to receive what God wants to say to you today? Because this is where it starts. Worship starts in the heart, not in the head. <laughs> and uh, part of why I like to hold my Bible over my head is to remind me of that, that God's ways are above my ways. So um, can we just get that first scripture up there, please, Mike? So they can read the verse. Okay, you can, you can rest your Bible for a minute so you don't get arm weary. <laughs> or I could just have you repeat after me. How about we do that? This is from Psalm 144.1. Who trains, you say it, my hands for war and my fingers for battle. <laughs> That's a short verse. Who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. So, Lord, we thank you. That's who we are today. We are warriors in the kingdom of God, and you give us that ability to, to worship you as a form of a weapon of your kingdom, and that we are not wimpy people that hang in the back, but we are out on the front lines doing what you've asked us to do. We will not pull back from the battle, but we want to be like David, who ran towards Goliath. <laughs> Let us be runners towards the battle, Lord, because we're confident and we know who we are in you and that you have already given us the victory. And we ask you, Lord, that you would weaponize our worship as we go forward today. Open our hearts to understand what that means today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated. Good. There you go. You saw it. So I'm going to talk about worship, which is one of my favorite subjects. Give a little history of my life, I guess, because music has been a part of my life since a young kid. A lot of you know I started playing the accordion when I was a little kid because my family was Italian and that was like the, uh, the designated uh, instrument. And then I watched the Beatles and there was no accordion player on the, uh, on the stage. And I was like, Dad, these girls are screaming at these guys and they're, they really like them. Do you think, you know, like the accordion, nobody's screaming at anybody playing an accordion. <laughs> so I switched to the guitar after a couple of other things and um, all for the wrong reasons. You know, it was all to meet girls. I wasn't a Christian, but I really had a, a sensitive heart towards music, even as an unbeliever. And there is something different about music, isn't there? It's like, did anybody get touched by that video today? Like, and it wasn't really a touching in the mind as much as it's somewhere else in your body. Where was that thing? Like, if they cut you open, they can't find where that place is, but it's your soul, right? It's that part of you that's like, oh, my God, I am part of such a bigger thing than just me. And you see, it didn't matter what the seed was. They were all singing the same song in very different circumstances, right? They cut from little kids together with a mom, you know, cleaning a bathroom. But while you're cleaning the bathroom, you can teach your kid this song. Or a guy riding his bike and taking a selfie. That looked a little dangerous to me. Uh, people in the car are singing. It didn't matter. And then this huge, like, Madison Square Garden looking place where they're all singing it together. It doesn't matter. It's from the heart. And that's where the issues of life flow. You're supposed to guard your heart because out of it flow the issues of life. And worship can become a weapon against the discouragement that the enemy tries to throw at every one of us, right? Anybody here lived your life without any discouragement, right? But all of us go through different seasons. Might be our fault, might not be our fault, but you're, you're feeling the pain of other people and you could feel discouraged. You're not seeing the result. So here, say this with me. We have an unfair advantage. His name is the Holy Spirit. Of course, Jesus and the Father, too. But the Holy Spirit in this application is that we can be, like Rich was saying, right out in the middle of a secular workforce. And it's not necessarily, you know, okay to talk about Christian uh, principles overtly. But you can talk about the underlying truth behind it. And in that case, it was servant leadership. Now, he wouldn't have been able to just talk about it unless he was modeling it. Right? And, and that's another way he didn't go into all that detail, but like he has modeled it from the beginning. And without that, then it sounds like an empty promise, doesn't it? But when your heart gets shifted and, and you are a worshiper, what does Jesus say in John chapter 4? The Father is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So it's not just that you're mouthing the words of truth, because they are truth. And, and we know this one, like who the sun sets free is. But you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, right? So Jesus gives us the truth, but if I don't know it, I don't get free in the area where I don't know it. So it's spirit and in truth, right? I have to 
be engaged in this process and say, I'm going to face each day and some things are going to come my way that I'm not going to like, but I'm going to worship you through that anyway. And my worship is going to become a weapon against the enemy's attempt to try to distract me. And really, frankly, to this morning on our worship team, that's what it was. It was all little distractions. And like after a while, you just get used to it and expect it. And you start to say, this is going to be a really good day. Because there's so many stupid little things going wrong, things not working, things that you've used a hundred times. And all of a sudden, there's a glitch in it. Why? Because he knows if he can get you distracted, he can get you upset and get you emotionally hijacked, you're not going to focus on what God is asking you to do. Don't let him do it. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. That's a weapon. It's not conditioned on whether I feel happy today or not. Because you're not going to feel happy sometimes. So if your goal in life is happiness, you got a problem. If your goal in life is to please the Lord, then whether you're happy or not, right, you could still feel meaning in your life because you're doing his work. So Jesus said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me, whether I'm happy or not. And worship is a weapon. Carolyn sang it in that, in that awesome song. My worship is a weapon. My shout is a weapon. My dance is a weapon against that thing that's trying to pull me down and keep me in bed depressed. It's pretty scary what the statistics are in America today about people that are living under depression. So I, I, was, I found it interesting that, you know, the, the word the Lord gave me, actually, if you remember, I was talking about a meeting we had last Saturday in Pittman, New Jersey, which is down by Cherry Hill. And we were with John and Cheryl Price and Marty Cassidy and other people. It was amazing. Were you there, Barbara? Wasn't it an amazing meeting? It was like three hours straight of different people trading the mic, giving prophetic words, praying for people, testimonies of people coming back from the dead. It was one of the best meetings I've ever been in, actually. And as we were there, the Lord gave me a word, and it was that he would weaponize my weakness. So part two of that that he gave me during the week is that he weaponizes my worship. Because they're very connected, right? It's in that time when you're feeling weak that you have a choice to either have the pity party and unplug yourself and say, I've tried this, it doesn't work, I give up. Or you could say, no, God, I know you're faithful. And, and it's so important to hear the songs in your spirit, man, because you got scripture in there, right? It's that faithful you are, faithful forever you will be. That's that, that song, right? Like you could just hear those choruses coming up inside of you. You leave the 99 and you come to find the one, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. He chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Yet he gives his life away to us. He still gives it away. And you got to just keep encouraging yourself with the truth of the word. Now, we're memorizing scripture. That's important. But as you're meditating on songs, if they're Christian, they're going to be based on scriptural principles. And today we were making decrees after one decree after another. Something happens when your voice comes through your system and you make that decree. I know who I am. Right? Like, it's not a haughty thing. It's like, wait a minute, devil, who do you think you're talking to? I'm a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. God chose me. Why? Not on my merit, but by his love. And it's unconditional. And I'm moving forward and becoming more like him every day. I mean, that really should be our goal, right? So I, I never really heard this word weaponized when I was growing up. It's kind of more of a modern word. And I looked it up, and it, it didn't come into the language until 1957. And it was the military that used it, as you would imagine. And it says here, can you get to that next one? Yeah, there, you can see it now. It says the dictionary says weaponized in 57. And then at the onset of the Cold War, scientists first weaponized rockets, fitting them with nuclear material and equipping them for launch. And I'm going to say the, the rockets, in my analogy, is our prayers and our worship. But also in the decade of the decree, it's also our words become a weapon, especially when you speak the truth. So if you find yourself being negative, like really negative, is that the Lord or the devil? <laughs> like what was the big complaint in the, in the desert was the Lord was saying, uh, Moses kept saying they're murmuring and complaining, they're murmuring and complaining, and the Lord was not pleased with the murmuring and the complaining. And it becomes part of the atmosphere that you're in if that's what you're doing all the time because 10 of the spies came back with a bad report. And only two came back and said, no, no, we could take this land. So you can't get infected by your culture that's around you. And I, I know many of us in our jobs, it could be very negative, right? Lots of cursing, lots of stuff to talk about that. I'm shocked by things that people say in the workforce. But it's like, no, remember Daniel? When he was in Babylon, he was a captive. He wouldn't eat their diet. 
So you don't have to eat the world's food. You say, you know what, I'm gonna just have vegetables. And you watch and see if two weeks from now I'm not in a healthier shape than the rest of these people. And he was, right? So you can live by a different standard. You're in the world, but you don't have to be of the world. And Jesus even prayed to the Father and said, I pray, Lord, that, not that you take them out of the world, but that you prosper them in the world. That's my, that's my summary of that. So our unfair advantage is the Holy Spirit, and our rockets are prayers. And God weaponizes our rockets of prayers and worship as we keep decreeing and declaring. Even in the course of your day, you might not even be consciously thinking about it, but there's a song going in, in your spirit, man, that's over, over, repeating over and over again the truth of the Word of God in a song. Now, if you're not saved, music probably is affecting you in a different way, and you got suicide songs going over in your head, maybe. Or songs that just completely contradict the Word of God, like, me and Mrs. Jones got a thing going on. How about that one? Anybody old enough to remember that one? Here's the, the killer. We both know it's wrong, but it's much too strong to let it go now. That is a blatant lie. Blatant lie. You got no thing going on because Mr. Jones is going to find you with his shotgun, okay? <laughs> then you can have no thing going on. Oh, God, help us. Help us. Because the words of the songs, if you're not saved, are also going through your brain. And the devil uses that as a weapon. So you're in a war either way. I want to be on God's side. I know you do too. And look, the language of warfare is not meant to be so like negative and hostile. It's like when sin came into the garden, a war started. When Jesus came and defeated death, that was a major victory. And it says now death has been defeated. We live in this place between Jesus' resurrection and when he returns where we have the power, but we have to access it. We have to be intentional about accessing that power. It, when he comes back for the final uh, return, triumphant return, we will have what Adam and Eve had. There will be perfect communion with God. No more sin, no more dying. In the meantime, we have a part to play in this. And if we get discouraged, it's going to be hard for us to be able to be as effective as he would want us to be. So I already quoted it, 2 Corinthians 10, it says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the demolishing of strongholds. We tear down every argument that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. See, these are action words. This is not passive, like, oh, Jesus did it all. I can't change his mind if I pray. He's, you know, he's uh, sovereign and, and my prayers don't make a difference. Tell, your prayers make a difference, okay? He wants to see your heart. Remember when Jesus was talking to the father of the child that kept having spasms and throwing himself in the fire, and Jesus said, how long has he been like this? You really think Jesus didn't know how long he'd been like that? But we get these questions because he wants to see our heart. He wants to hear with kind of faith. He said that, when I return, will I find faith in the earth? Well, if you're not saturating yourself in the word and worship and with other Christians and, and with life-giving relationships and people around you, it's going to be hard for him to find faith in us. We have to be really intentional and recognize the war, okay? And then in Exodus 15.3, it says, the Lord is a man of war. So it's not like he's against warfare. He gets it. It's all throughout the old and the new. Um, in fact, the Lord of hosts, that name for God, means the God of the angel armies. And if you read the Message Bible, you see it all the time. Chris Tomlin had a very famous song about that, the God of angel armies, right? He's always by my side. So there's nothing to be afraid about with this, with this topic. The thing to be afraid of is that you underestimate your opponent. Don't underestimate your opponent. He wants to take you out. That's what Peter said, that he roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And I've heard people say, you know, like is it the toothless lion. But listen, lies have power. So if you believe it, there's a real tooth there. The reason someone would say it's a toothless lion is because the truth pulls out his dentures. <laughs> he can't gum you to death. <laughs> but if you believe the lie, there's power in the lie. He has no authority over us. But if you believe the lie, then he has power over you. So that's why this is so important to have the truth of the word of God in you and not for you to filter it and say, well, I believe this part, but I don't believe that part. Be really careful of that. In a way, that's kind of like blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean we can't have differences of opinion about what the word means, okay? Because that, that's true. That happens. But what is our goal and our intention is to be transformed into his image every day, more, with ever-increasing glory, it says. Yeah. 
All right, so let's go to the next one. Uh, is that where First Timothy is? Yeah, okay. So I just was remind, reminding myself of some of the verses of songs that I listened to before I became a Christian. Some of you may remember this. But at the top verse, it says, a Cold War is a state of political hostility between countries. So the political hostility in the kingdom of God is two different government systems, the government of Satan and the government of God. So they're at war with each other. Satan has no weapon he can use against us except a lie. Okay? So once you know the truth, you've countered his lie. The truth will counter the lie. Now, of course, there's sickness and there's disease. That was through Adam and Eve's sin. Death came in the garden. But we pray against all of that, right? And Jesus took the curse of that thing to the cross with him. So we believe it's God's will to heal us. And he's not using sickness to teach us a lesson. He wouldn't be a good father if he did that. So what does the devil use? It says threats, propaganda, and other, other measures short of open warfare. Because he can't touch you. You're God's child, but he can lie to you. And he can tempt you. So there's no weapon he could use against you except a lie. And you don't have to believe the lie. All right? So I don't know if you remember the song Stairway to Heaven. Uh, I sure don't like talking about secular songs in church. But I'm just trying to expose how the enemy uses these things to get in your brain. I was a musician in high school, and that's when that song came out. And we knew right away. It wasn't a stairway to heaven. It was a stairway to heroin. They're talking about drugs, talking about getting high. You know, if you buy this little bag, you'll feel like you're in heaven in about 15 minutes after you inject it. See, that's called medicating your pain. And that's why people use drugs. And it's so addictive that after the first one, it's almost impossible to stop. I remember one time a guy offered it to me for free when I was in college. I was a football player and, you know, I was in good shape, working out all the time. Another friend of ours who we knew was younger, and not in college, but all he did was throw his arm over the back seat and let a guy inject him with heroin. At, I think he was 16. And I don't know how long he lasted, but he died of it. At, you know, maybe 10 years later, I don't remember. It might have been more. But, like, once that first hook gets in, it, it's much harder. There's a big barb on that hook, and it's much harder to pull it out than it was to let it in, right? And there's all of this treacherous activity that goes on, and people think, oh, I could handle my alcohol, no problem. Yeah, 99 out of 100 times you handle it, but that, that hundredth time only takes one mistake to get a girl pregnant, right. and that's going to change your life. Right now, you could say, well, you know, had an abortion, and, and we would never condemn anybody for having an abortion prior to you getting saved, right? We all made horrible, horrible decisions and choices, but now, hopefully that you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit says, that's a life. And maybe you could put the child up for adoption if there's a mistake. I'm not condemning anybody or judging. I'm saying you have a whole new grid that you look through, and you could be healed of any of the pain that came with that. But if a girl that's not a Christian thinks, oh, it's no big deal, I'll just have a procedure, there's something really profound about life. And, and destroying a life in your, in your body, it's going to scar you emotionally uh, as a woman and a man too. You know, we're, we're meant to raise children and raise families and not take them out, right? So there's, there's scar tissue that we have from when we were living a belligerent lifestyle against God. And now all of a sudden he's saying, no, I love this, uh, before I get to those songs, 1 Timothy 1.18. This charge I entrust you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them, say it with me, you may... Wage the good warfare. So you're supposed to get your word and war over your word. Yeah. Not just for you, for your children, for your family, for your finances, for all the things that he tries to use against us and lie to us about for favor on your job. War over those things. What does that mean? You're not passive. You war over your word. Now, another one, I don't know if you remember the Beatles, so Stairway to Heaven was voted on many of the things I looked at as the number one song, rock song, and then the Beatles were recommended as the number one band, okay? Anybody old enough to remember the Beatles? Remember the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds? Did you ever wonder what the heck they're talking about? Does that make any sense as a title of a song? It's LSD, <laughs> Lucy Sky Diamond. It's like code words, right? It's what drug dealers do. They, they talk with code. So, I mean, they got totally messed up on LSD, and then they opened this big pit of hell when, when they got involved with Hare Krishna and all that stuff. They were impacting kids all over the world with that. What if they had become Christian, right? They could have easily become Christian, but the devil pulled them in the wrong direction. And then the last one, sympathy for the devil. Is there anything hidden about that? As a senior in high school, I went to Madison Square Garden and saw the Rolling Stones, and this was their final song. 
I mean, how, how much more blatant can it be? We have no sympathy for the devil as Christians, okay? And you can read it, and it's really like there's, there's this whole thing around that scene of rebellion is, 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 is looked at like a good thing. Like you're on the edge, and you're, you're going to steal, and, and hell's angels are looked at as if they're cool. They're not cool, okay? They're murderers. So which camp you want to be in, it's pretty obvious, right? I want to be in God's camp. I want my works and my thoughts to be productive and redemptive for the kingdom of God. But if I'm not careful, there's a whole bunch of noise coming in my ears that's going to try to pull me the other way. And the devil has a big arsenal, so it doesn't matter which one he uses. He's going to find the one that works on you. And then you have to say, nope, sorry, I'm not giving into this thing. I have weapons of warfare too. This is number one, word of God. Spirit, number two, Jesus as our model, knowing the Father's love. These are all the cornerstone principles that we have to own. We have to own them. It can't be somebody else's understanding. You have to own all those things. We doing okay? All right, so I just wanted to give you an example of weaponized worship in the Word, okay? And a lot of you already know it, but I always came back to this as a young Christian, and, and I had been playing guitar for a long time already. When, uh, when I became a Christian. And it's right out of first, uh, Samuel 16, verse 17. says, Saul, talking to his soldiers, was being harassed by a spirit, and he said, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Okay? So there's something even the world would say is that music calms the savage beast. You ever heard that one? Yeah. Remember the cartoons when you were a kid? Did you ever see the animals were just going crazy, and all of a sudden they'd play a song, <laughs> and, and they would calm down? What is that? Like, what is it about music that does that? It touches a different part of us. It's not our brain. It's not logic. It's somewhere way closer to our heart. And you know it's got this other factor to it because you could hear a song after 20 years. And first time you hear it after 20 years, you're brought back to the place you were where you have a memory with that song. Right? There, there's a spiritual aspect to music. But if it's not directed redemptively through the Lord, it's going to be used to destroy when you, here's another one, Stevie Winwood. When you see a chance, take it. Like, if you could cheat on that guy's girl, with that guy's girlfriend, the door's open, go for it. That's exactly what he meant. I'm not even going to quote other ones because they're too foul. So anyway, they understood in the Bible that Saul was being harassed by a tormenting spirit. But if we could find somebody who can play anointed music, the spirit will leave. Isn't that amazing? They knew that. So then it says in verse 18, one of the servants said, look, I've seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite who's a, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and handsome person, and as if that wasn't enough, the Lord is with him. All he had to say was, the Lord is with him, <laughs> no matter what you look like, okay? God doesn't judge the outside package, does he? He looks at the heart. We talked about that last week. But he did have all those other attributes. And how did he, this servant, know about David? He was on the backside of a mountain. But see, the Bible says in Proverbs that your gift, you know it, will make room for you. That's Proverbs 18, 16. Your gift will make room for you and bring you before a great man. Now, that could be your natural gift of playing music, but it could also be a gift. What good timing, Brian. See, he's saying, I'm sowing into that word right now. I believe that, that my gift is going to make room. So it could also be a gift to the Lord, right? I'm not trying to manipulate anybody. I'm just saying that if you try to promote yourself and you're always out there saying, like in the beginning when we first opened the church, we would get cold calls. Uh, Minister Frank, whoever, wants to come and speak at your church. When can he come? And we're like, we don't even know you. Who are you? Can you imagine Jesus ever doing that? Hey, I'm really short on, uh, on dates. I don't have my calendar. I got to fill up my calendar. Make some cold calls. What about the anointing? That's what we're looking for. Not cold calls, okay? Anyway, whatever. You get my point. They knew about David, not because he tried to promote himself, because when you have talent, people know about it. When you have an anointing, people know about it. It's on your life. There's oil on your life. The oil of the anointing of the Holy Spirit comes on your life because you're in your zone. Now, clearly, David found his zone. Skillful in playing, mighty man of arrow, man of war, prudent in speech, handsome person, and the Lord is with him. That's called convergence. That's finding your zone and operating at a higher level because you're where you're supposed to be. You're in the right place at the right time. And for such a time as this, who knows? That Esther said that. 
for such a time as this, that I'm in the right place at the right time, and let's see what happens. And if I die, I die. Right? And that's what David said, too. He's like, look, who is this uncircumcised Philistine shouting down the armies of God? He's going down. My worship is a weapon. David took a lyre, that was a guitar, and played it. And Saul was refreshed and became well, and the evil spirit left him. There's deliverance. That is weaponized worship. Something about the anointing on David's life. He comes in, and Saul's being tormented, and the spirit leaves just through the anointing. That should be a major lesson for us. Amen? I don't know what the number is right now, but I looked at it not long ago. And the number of views on YouTube for the song, uh, What a Beautiful Name by Hill Songs, was over 300 million. See, so if you don't think there's some unsafe people smuggling Jesus in in the music, you're wrong. They're not all saved. That was the 300 million Christians that were watching that. It's an anointed song. And it's, and it's penetrating the airwaves and it's touching people's hearts. And all of a sudden they're being forced to say, I wonder what I really do believe. It says it's a weapon against the kingdom of darkness. He hates the anointing. The devil hates the anointing. So I mentioned that I was going to mention Harriet Tubman, and I haven't seen the movie, but I've done enough. I know that she's being considered to be put on one of our, on our currency, the first woman that would be considered to be put on our currency. And I don't know why that's been delayed. It should have already happened from what I was reading. But that's quite an honor for somebody who couldn't read or write, right? And just as, as this pillar of, of a historical figure. I don't know if she later learned how to read or write. I don't know that much about her. But I do know this, that she was what they call on the internet the conductor of the uh, Underground Railroad. You can put the next one up. There she is. Okay. And that's what it says. Harriet Tubman was the conductor of the Underground Railroad. One of the songs she taught her crew as she was trying to get them out was called Wade in the Water. It's believed that she used this traditional Negro spiritual as a way to warn slaves to get in the water to hide their scent from the slave-catching dogs on their trail. Oh, I read that and I just sat back in my chair and went, oh my God, what a, what a turn of a phrase. First of all, the, the strategy of getting under the water so the dogs can't smell you, that's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's when Israel was escaping Egypt and God hid them in the cloud. So you could be walking through a tough situation, right? So it says about Jesus, he just walked through the crowd. They were ready to throw him off the mountain, but God puts a protective envelope around you. And she knew enough to say, if you get in the water and you get underwater, the, the scent won't be obvious to the dogs and you could hide. But look, think about how she used a, a Christian song to, as a weapon in warfare to protect these people, to get them out. Uh, and I, should, I would never know what it's like to be hunted like an animal, where dogs are trying to chase me down. But what the Lord showed me is that drugs was like a slave catching dog that was on my trail. And, and, and you know, it might not be drugs. It could be other things. It could be opioids. Well, I, I, that would be a drug. But you might have started because you had an accident and you were in pain and your neck was bothering you and they prescribed prescription drugs to you, but you, you kept taking them. See, unlike me, you know, using them, uh, I won't even go why I was, never mind. Scratch that from the record. <laughs> There's a lot of slave catching dogs that are after us today. And I'm in no way demeaning what she had to go through and what these people had to go to. But what's the spiritual application? And it could be food. You know, we talked about that the last few weeks, is that we could have an unhealthy relationship with food. We know we all need it. It's legal. As Christians, we're all allowed to go out to eat together. But we have to be really careful that we have the right approach to this subject. And no way meaning being condemning. I'm just trying to expose a tactic of the enemy, is, is for us to have an unhealthy relationship with the food and use it for comfort instead of using it for nourishment. That's another lie. Jesus gives you more comfort than Ben and Jerry's. And again, no condemnation. But what about tobacco? If there was ever a slave catching dog, tobacco. It's right on the package. This product can cause cancer. And again, I'm not condemning anybody that might still be smoking, but we want to encourage you to come up for prayer and let us help you break that thing off your life. 
So many of us, we're not pulling rank on anybody. I was a drug addict. If Jesus didn't free me, I'd be dead. So I know it's real. But it's not just tobacco. It could be alcohol. It could be pornography as the slave catching dog. Can't stop. You try to stop, but you can't stop. That is a problem. If you find yourself that you can't stop and, and you get triggered. So I, I've been talking about Russ Taff a lot. And he went clean for 10 years. But then when his mother died, he got triggered. See, a profound event happens that stressed him out. And, and all that structure that he had built to stay away from the alcohol collapsed by the power of his mother dying and the fact that he hadn't forgiven her, OK? So you have to be careful that, oh, no, I don't have a problem in that area. I only use it once in a while. Well, you know, try to stop. <laughs> Just try to stop. And if you can't, that's a problem. So watch out for the triggers, too. And then you ever hear of cross addiction? I, I could use a double entendre here. We should be addicted to the cross. But cross addiction in, in the parlance of addict, addiction recovery is you quit drinking, but then you become addicted to the internet. And you, you know, you, the problem of addiction didn't go away. You just stopped drinking. It's like a dry drunk, right? You, the compulsive behavior is still in there. And one of the quotes I said, they may have quit drinking, the individual has yet to deal with the emotional baggage that led them to alcohol in the first place. See, so until you get to that route, you're really not free. I mean, everybody okay? I just want to go through a couple of statistics because it's easy to get to live in our bubble and, not, and forget how, how much pain the world is in. And what this man, Juan, did today is he stepped into a kingdom that's going to allow him to be free. Clearly free from the guilt of sin. That's, that's the first thing that Jesus does is lets us know that we're forgiven. Right? So you don't have to beat yourself up and think, yeah, but what about this? What about that? I did this. I did that. The Bible's full of people like Paul the Apostle, who was a murderer of Christians. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. In your weakness, God's strength is perfected. You can throw yourself on the mercy of the court and say, I'm sorry. I failed you again. I, I, didn't, do, I didn't mean to do it. And he'll give me strength in that weakness. So this says... Romans 6, 18, having been freed from sin, you now become a servant to righteousness. So it's not enough to just stop drinking. You have to then find another thing that's redemptive and powerful, and you get addicted to the Lord. <laughs> that is Bible language. There is a verse in there that talks about being addicted to ministry in a healthy way. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Give us this day our... So every day, like the, the Lord is telling us to pray that way. Today, I don't want to forget you. I, I, I've been a Christian for five days. Give me a weekend off so I can party. <laughs> well, people make deals with God all the time, right? So what does it say? 70,000 drug overdose deaths in, in 2017 in America. Highest ever in history. Half of opioid-related deaths are due to this drug called fentanyl. 1.4 million people attempted suicide in 2017. 47 of 47,173 were successful. How bad does it have to be for 1.4 million people to attempt suicide? It's way more common than you realize. People are struggling a lot more than you realize. It's not the kind of thing anybody's going to want to talk about, right? But there's a ton of pain. And when they meet Christians that have joy, and have a peace of God about them, and are using worship as a weapon to keep the enemy from getting them depressed, that is a really encouraging witness to them that maybe there's a way out of this thing. And then abortion, 500,000, it said in 2016, was the leading cause of death in America. You know, not, not that some parts of the media wouldn't consider that, but this was a Christian source, and I think you've got to put it on there. Heart disease, cancer, tobacco, and then alcohol-related death, 88,000 in one year related to alcohol. So again, like you drink 99 times, you're okay, but that last time you go too far because you got triggered over something, car crash. Like, wow, be careful. Nobody's that good all the time. So have discipline about it. Like, you know, give yourself a cutoff and say, that's it, or don't drink. You know, that, that was my solution. That was really easy. The math is very simple. If I don't have the first one, I don't have the tenth one. Ten was no problem for me in my day. <laughs> and then 40% of convicted murderers had used alcohol before or during the crime. So you see the door of the devil just gets you to open this door to the pit. 
And violence, especially with alcohol, right? Violence is just a major factor that comes alongside that. So I'm not saying don't drink. It's not a sin to have a glass of wine. It's not, it's not a sin to have a beer. Right? We don't want to be legalistic about it. But just make sure that you know your boundaries and that you stick within those boundaries if you want to flourish. All right. I hope you're not thinking I'm being uh, legalistic here. I'm just trying to warn you. It's the rules of engagement. You're in a war. How am I doing on time? Yeah, I'm getting close. There's just a couple of stories in the Old Testament that I want to I review that really highlight how important worship is. And, and I'll, I'll just give you a little bit of a background for it because maybe we're not getting in the Old Testament as much as we could be, but there's a lot of truth and a lot of lessons in there for us. And, and it's the history of the nation of Israel, right? And they have many ups and downs. They had a, a season of judges, and there was a, a cycling problem where God would raise up a man of God, and then they would fall into sin. And then God would raise up another man of God or woman of God, and they would fall into sin again after a while, and he would have to raise up another champion. And then they got into this whole thing of wanting a king, remember? Talked about that with David and Saul. But in 2 Kings, it's a little different. And you might remember this, but it's about Elisha, E-L-I-S-H-A, right? Not Elijah. The, the understudy to Elijah was Elisha. And he asked God for a double mantle, and God gave it to him. Like, how many would like a double mantle? Yeah, see, that's a good prayer, isn't it? That's a declaration. I declare this is the, the, the year of a double mantle anointing over my life. But, but here's the setup. Uh, first of all, in 2 Kings 6, it says, he called his servants. This was the king of Syria that was trying to attack Israel. And just one more little history note. At the time, Israel was split into two kingdoms the northern kingdom of Israel, and then Judah to the south, right? And that's why you remember it happened prior that David first became king of Judah, and, and there was kind of a civil war going on between Judah and Israel. But at this point in 2 Kings 6, there's a war of the Syrians coming against the northern kingdom. So the, the Syrian king said, what's going on here, uh, my version, verse 11? He called his servants and said, will you show me who of us is for the king of Israel? He thought there was a spy in the camp because every time he tried to attack them, they had moved already. And the servant says, oh, no, it's none of us, Lord. It's Elisha, the prophet who's in Israel. He tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. I mean, like that gift. Well, are you asking for it? Yes, Lord, stir up the gifts that are inside of me. So the Syrian king sent three horses, chariots, and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. Verse 15 of 2 Kings 6, when the servant of the man of God who rose early and went out, behold, an army of horses and chariots was around the city. And he said, alas, my master, what shall I do? And Elisha answered, fear not. Say that with me. Fear not. Say this too. For those with us are more than those with them. One more time. For those with us are more than those with them. How many believe that? All right, you better not be seated in the natural, but it's in the spirit. Elijah said, just open his eyes, Lord, and show him the heavenly host that's around us. Show him the army of angels that are around us so that he won't get discouraged. Uh, okay, so, but if you go back a little bit, that was a good scene, right? Because Elisha was operating in tandem with the northern kingdom of Israel. But prior to that, they had been enemies. And I'll give you why. I'm just going to, again, briefly just talk about this, and we'll wrap it up. In 2 Kings 2, right? We just read 6. But if you go back to chapter 2, that's when Elijah said, Elijah, the, the father in the, in the story you know, of Elisha, said, ask what I may do for you before I'm taken away from you. I'd like that one too. I don't want to die. Give me a, a, a fiery chariot to get me out of here. So he knew that he was going to be taken out on a chariot. He's like, look, they're going to be here soon. Ask me what you want before I go. And how many of you would know to say, give me a double portion of your spirit? If you're leaving, I want double what you got. Why not ask? What's the harm in asking? And, and he even said, well, you've asked a tough thing, but here's the condition. If you see me when I'm taken away from you, it shall be so for you. But basically, if you don't see me, it won't be so. Verse 11 says, then it happened. Suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven and Elisha saw it. What does that mean? He got the double mantle, see? Now, six chapters later, I'm far, sorry, in chapter six, four chapters later, we see those fiery chariots again. But they had already come down in chapter two and picked up Elijah. Talk about Uber, man. 
Give me that app. Oh, all day long. But here comes the tricky part. Ah, this is so powerful what happens in these next couple of verses. Elisha is a prophet of God with a double mantle of Elijah, but he's still a human being. He's still subject to moods. Anybody here qualify? <laughs> right? You see why we have to be so strict about being intentional. I'm going to serve you, Lord. It's not conditional. I'm not going to serve you when I feel like it. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to be obedient. And in those days when I'm having a really hard time, I know that in my weakness, your strength will be perfected. Right? You don't look at my weakness as a negative thing. You look at it, we said a couple weeks ago, like a portal to your power in my life. But even if I'm having a bad day and I'm, I'm getting triggered. Right? Anybody know what I mean when I say that? Talked about it with the drugs, but it could be Thanksgiving's coming up. And you're going to see somebody you haven't seen since last Thanksgiving. And maybe they trigger you. Mm, there could be a whole bunch of family stuff there, right? Layers of stuff. It's, it's been common. Movies have been made about that. It's supposedly comedies, but it's actually a lot of truth in there. So if you're Elisha and you loved Elijah, who was Elijah's main enemies? Husband and wife? Ahab and? How famous are they? Really famous for all the wrong reasons. Right? Jezebel spirit. You go on the internet and look up preaching sermons on the Jezebel spirit, and you'll see hundreds of them. People are still talking about her. Not him as much, but he was real bad. He was a wicked king over Israel. I mean, that's a bad problem, isn't it? Because when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked are in authority, they mourn, and rightfully so. So look, when Ahab died, this is 2 Kings 3. Verse 5, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So that would have been Ahab's son. His name is Joram, J-O-R-A-M. Verse 7, you see it. Why? Because this king of Moab is going to test the new kid and see if he's got the strength to resist like, like Ahab did. Joram sent to Jehoshaphat. Now that's the southern kingdom. And he asked him, will you fight with me against this enemy? Jehoshaphat could have said no. Because we're at odds with each other. Why, why do we even have two kings? There shouldn't be two countries. I'm not going to help you. The Lord's going to bring a, bring a loss to you in this battle. But Jehoshaphat didn't say that. The king of Mo, This is what Joram said. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me? And, and Jehoshaphat said, I will go. I am as you are. My people as your people. My horses as your horses. So Joram's real happy about that. Because Jehoshaphat didn't have to say that. Joram said, which way shall we go up? And Jehoshaphat said, the way through the wilderness of Edom. Probably a mistake in retrospect, because they didn't do well, and they were, they were dying out there, basically. And Joram, being Ahab's descendant, said, oh, no, the Lord has brought us out here to let us die in the wilderness. <laughs> and Jehoshaphat says, wait a minute, in this verse 11, is there no prophet of the Lord here by whom we can inquire of the Lord? So let me tell you, when you're in this church and you ask this question, 10 people will show up, right? Because that's the kind of environment I want to be in. There's going to be prophetic people around you here, and that could be threatening or not. It doesn't have to be threatening if you've got nothing to hide. But, you know, the words of prophecy are supposed to be edifying. So if anybody ever, you know, judges you or, or gives you a harsh word, that's not God, right? I mean, it could be corrective, but it should be out of love. That's another day's sermon. <laughs> but there's plenty of prophetic people in the house. Oh, boy, but we're about to have a little dumpster fire, they would say in my business. Like, there's, there's a problem coming up here because there's some undealt with baggage. Ah, see, is there no prophet here? And then one of the king's servants said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who served Elijah, is here. And Jehoshaphat, remember the southern kingdom guy, he says, the word of the Lord is with him. So Joram, the king of Israel, and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom all went down to see Elisha. So let's just imagine that Joram looks like his mother and father. Right? That would be understandable. The child looks like the parents, right? So they come walking up, and Elisha sees them coming. And who does he look at first? The one that reminds him of Ahab and Jezebel. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think he's feeling right now? Warm and fuzzy. Oh, boy. See, like, you got to really watch your heart. He's a prophet. Jehoshaphat is counting on Elisha to be right with the word. It's life and death on the line. 
So you don't want to come up to a soulish prophet. Somebody who's operating out of their soul realm is going to give you a bad word. That, there's a big warning against that in the Bible, right? It's got to be true. Hmm. Okay, so Elisha, I think, was a little grouchy that day. And he says to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? Not like, hey, good to see you. How's it going? Do you like this palace? You took over for your father. You passed away. I'm so sorry your father passed away. He was such a nice guy. <laughs> right? That's when your nose is growing. As you're saying those things, you can see your nose growing in front of you because you know you're lying. What have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your wicked father Ahab and your wicked mother Jezebel. Now, is that how you want to meet the prophet? Because you know, they're going to be calling down fire pretty quick. That's biblical. Like, you're like, oh, Joram's probably going, I knew we shouldn't have come to this guy. <laughs> but the king of Israel said to him, no, no. The Lord has called us, these three kings, together to deliver us into the hand of Moab. <laughs> See how negative he is? He's already assuming the worst. Well, if you had Ahab and Jezebel as your parents, you might too. And Elisha had Elijah, and he has a double portion. So Elijah says, I think in a little bit of a sneer, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I respect the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I wouldn't even look at you, Joram. Key right here. But now bring me a minstrel. <laughs> he knew enough to self, he was self-aware enough to know, I can't give a word right now because it's going to come through a really dirty filter. But I need a minstrel to come in and clear the atmosphere, get rid of all this noise, all this triggering that I'm feeling by seeing these wicked people. And I, I have enough respect for Jehoshaphat to say, I got to hear from God. And if I go this, in this condition, I'm in trouble. And they're in trouble. And he had enough fear of the Lord to wait until, remember, David drove away that evil spirit. You get the anointing in the room, and all of a sudden, boom, things clear over your head. That's actually a verse in the Psalms. It says, it was all so confusing to me until I entered your sanctuary. And then all those confusing thoughts left and clarity. It's like true north became evident again. And it's so powerful, right? The minstrel played... While the minstrel played, the hand and power of the Lord came on Elisha, and he said, thus saith the Lord. <laughs> See, with confidence, not through the wrong filter, not through him being triggered. So this is the spiritual condition of your life, right? Like, you want to make sure you're in a healthy condition before you answer people, before you respond in the wrong attitude. Not that you don't have to be firm with people. Sometimes you do. But let it be driven by the Lord's presence, not our soulish pleasure. Amen? That's weaponizing Elisha's worship. And God gave them the word, and they won the victory. See, because the, the right word came through. Believe in that for yourself? A little louder, and I'll finish. Yeah, stand up. Time to read our marching orders. <laughs> it's almost like I want to salute when I read this. You know, like we're looking at the king, and, and we're about, he's about to send us out on our mission, and this is what he's saying to us. I don't know, it's kind of small. Can you read it? All right, so this is in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Paul is saying, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. A little louder. Think on these things. You need to control yourself. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. He only did what he saw his father doing. So you can ask yourself that question. This thing I'm about to do right now, did Jesus see the father doing this? Boy, that would clean up a whole bunch of mess, wouldn't it? Let's stop it right in its tracks. And you know me, I can't get through a service without the Passion Translation somewhere. And this is how Brian Simmons interpreted it in Philippians 4.8. He says, so keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real. Just so stop for a minute and just dwell on that for a minute. So the, the devil's a counterfeit. That's what lies are. A counterfeit bill is a lie. It's not the true U.S. dollar bill, right? It's counterfeit. 
So keep yourself thinking on these true things. Keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic. It could be a minor thing like gossip. And I don't know if this is the Lord prompting me right now or not, but that can hide really easily as prayer. <laughs> you know, you get together with people and you start talking about, oh, no, we weren't gossiping. We were just going to pray for them. And I just wanted my friend to know what was going on in their life for the last 45 minutes. No, I don't think it takes 45 minutes to pray for somebody. God knows the problem. Get it? Like, it's subtle. It sounds like you can justify it, but is it really this? Is it really authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind? And then I love this. Fasten your thoughts. Isn't that a great word picture? Fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him always. Look, there's going to be something we're going to have to deal with, right, for the rest of our lives that we're here. There's going to be things that try to come in and, and rob it from us, but I love the to think that my worship over here is a weapon against the devil. Whenever I'm singing those songs that we sang this morning, I know who I am. Come on, come on and praise it. My praise is a weapon, right? Like, how about that? Raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. Heaven comes to fight for me. I don't have to fight it. Jehoshaphat's the same guy that went in the head of the battle ahead of the soldiers. How scary would that have been? But if you believe God's got the angel army, you march in, praising the Lord. Let's lift our hands. Lord, we are all worshipers here of you, the one true God. We know your voice, and we're not going to follow the voice of a stranger. So, Lord, we just pray you sanctify this vessel that we're living in right now. We don't want any impurities in here. This is not legalism. It's not about judging from the outside. It's about our heart. And where is the affection of our heart? And, and fastening our thoughts to you, keeping our minds on the things above, not on the things of this earth, and really just being a voracious eater of your word. And, and a voracious worshiper, Lord, that senses Holy Spirit, because we want to be like David. When we walk in a room, the evil spirits leave over under the anointing. And we want to be as, as alert as Elijah was to know that when we're not in the right frame of mind, to wait and to clear the atmosphere, even if it means repenting and, and just making sure that we're operating from your spirit and not from our flesh. Lord, I thank you, each one of us here, is, is a, a soldier in your army, and we want a, we want a uh, promotion. Lord, we don't want to stay stuck as privates. We want promotions, Lord, and we know that comes through being obedient. Like Rich said earlier, there's a blessing in obedience. So Lord, as hard as it might be for us, we say nothing's impossible with you, and that we walk out of here victorious with more weapons that we, than when we came in. We leave here with a full arsenal of weapons in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen. Come up for prayer. You might have something harassing you, right? The Bible says that Jesus saw them as harassed and helpless. We want to stand in the gap with you and do battle with you on whatever that front is. Have an awesome day.